lost right now. <laughs> huh. We'll get through it together. It's okay. Uh, good. Karen uh, is there. So you can, if you go over to her, you can promote her to a panelist. Oh, indeed she is. So I want yeah. to promote her to a panelist. Excellent. Well, it was a moment when I was hoping you, you had to do this because I thought I'd be there with Karen, but a third time lucky. Oh, there she is. Great. And then um, yeah, once we get started, I can stay for a bit. I was going to say that um, I don't know if she's been promoted, uh, Jesse. I still see her as an attendee. Um, You're right. But if you go I mean, with I was the attendee... Oh, indeed. Karen, are you there? I tried clicking the promote to panelist a few times. It didn't seem to do anything. So I did allow her to talk. Yeah. Yeah. It's still muted. Maybe there's technical problem. I know she had problems with one computer. So maybe it's. <laughs> she might be waiting. Also... She might be in another room. Of course, we don't know that. The um, I mean, I was she gonna say, to be a hold on, she declined to be a panelist, and we'll try again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, I did that the other night. <laughs> okay, here she goes, she's yeah. rejoining as a panelist. Oh, good, yep, she's away. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes, yes. hi, hi. We can't we see you. So there you go. There you are. No, now you're muted. No, now you're muted. No. I don't think so. Yes, she is. Yeah. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. Now. Okay. Yes. Good job. Yeah. Okay. Good. Great. Okay. Okay. So I guess we've started our meeting. Yeah, we, we should do a, a sorry a roll call attendance just over Zoom. So are, are you ready <laughs> until we have officers, Nate? Sure. Yeah. So I can say I'm Nate Malloy, a planner with the town, and this is the May twenty second meeting of the uh, subcommittee for the planning board for housing. I'm Jesse Major. I'm here. I'm a member of the planning board and the subcommittee. I am Bruce Coldham. I am here, and. Uh... At this inaugural meeting of said committee. And I'm Karen Winter, and I am also here <clears throat> as a subcommittee of the planning board on housing. Karen, you're breaking up. A little bit. I'm breaking up? Yep. Maybe. Okay. I'm I'm here. I'm in the subcommittee on housing. My name is Karen Winter. Right, that's good. Sorry. Yeah. I think one one more foot forward and you're you're getting that uh, <laughs> start your signal. Okay. Um so I guess the first did you all get the agenda? Nate, yeah, you sent it to all of us. Right. So you two saw the agenda that Nate put together for us. Uh, I did, but I, but I don't it. remember it. So let me let me uh, just share. I'll um, just bring it oh, up yeah. on my Yeah, I mean first first um First um, uh, item was announcements, and usually we just start with that if there's anything to, to talk about. The um, I was going to say I think um, I think I mentioned it at the planning board. I'll just mention it again where uh, uh, quotes are due tomorrow for a consultant to help the town with that new a new housing production plan. So we're hopeful that you know we'll have someone on board, you know, pretty shortly in the next few weeks, and then you know the process is six to eight months or eight to ten months, but uh, you know, as you, the trust will be guiding the consultant staff will be, and if you want to continue to meet, you can as as well. Um, I can send you the scope of services uh, at some point once it, the contract is signed. Sure, that sounds good. Any other announcements? Um, I don't have any right now. Okay. So, um. Yeah, so first on the agenda was just to determine a schedule and other logistics, which I think importantly includes uh, us determining who our officers are to run the meetings, basically. 
And Nate, please just correct me if I am wrong. No, yeah, um, that sounds good. Yeah, I think we can have, you know, a chair or vice chairs or co-chairs. I don't know if you need any more than that. It's nice to have someone run a meeting and someone, uh, if that person's absent, uh, minutes. You know, this is recorded over Zoom and uh, we can get that uh, uh, into a into a brief minutes. I, I met with Jesse over the phone earlier and I said, it doesn't have to be exhaustive, uh, you know, like planning board, right? So I'm thinking just, you know, a summary of what's discussed. We're hoping to get a web page up through the planning board, through the town's website. So all meeting packets, it isn't for today, but it will be, uh, have a landing page so you can go to see agendas and packets and uh, everything, so. Good. So any any volunteers, I guess? So <laughs> Jesse, Jesse, I nominate you as the chair. Yeah. Um, do we need you... more than that? Well, what? I do. I, 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 I'm willing to accept the nomination, assuming we vote on it. But I do think there should be a co-chair in case I need to miss one, and we want the meeting to proceed anyway. And so, yes, I'm up for taking on a chair and organizing the minutes. I think is the only real responsibility. And I guess putting together okay. agendas, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, is is one of you interested in being an occasional co-chair if needed? Bruce, could do you do you think you could do it? You have so much more experience. You could probably do it with your left hand. <laughs> I'm left-handed. Also, uh, also no, I'd be happy to do that. Yes. Good. Okay. Great. And Nate, do we need to vote on these? Yeah, we could have a motion uh, for you know uh, Jesse as chair and Bruce as or co-chairs or Bruce as vice chair, and then have a vote. Okay, so I so move Jesse as chair and Bruce as co-chair. Uh, uh, I'll second it if I'm allowed to. <laughs> I, so know, one, um, one of us has to. <laughs> somebody has to second, so I, I don't know. Is Fred Je coming? Jesse did that. Fred's not here, so we have a motion uh, seconded. Um, and uh, and Nate, do you want to take the roll call again, just because we don't have yet? Uh, sure. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's any more discussion. Is there? No, not for me anyway. Oh right, no. yeah. I, I, all right, uh, Jesse, how do you vote? Uh, I. Yes, aye. Aye, yeah. and aye is to affirm the vote, Bruce? Yes. Aye. 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 Yes, and I approve. Great. Okay, Thanks, well, everyone. we did that. Thank, thank you for your faith in me. We'll yeah. see where it goes. So, yeah, so there's, just quickly, there's four members of the subcommittee, so three are needed for a quorum, and that we have that tonight. So, you know, that, um, you know, once we get, we have to have more than 50%, so... Uh, I think the important thing would be to have a meeting time where everyone can attend. And, you know, right now it's Wednesday evenings. Jesse had said a, a minute earlier that maybe it could change. And it's flexible on my end. If we're going to stay, stay over Zoom, uh, we can, you know, manage that. And I think it's really then up to the subcommittee. I think part of it would be, you know, determining a schedule now, at least for the next month or two, if, if not Wednesday evenings, because of planning board and other things, you know, what it could be during the day, it could be some other night, um, other day. So I think that's something could to be discussed right now. Yeah. So so my thoughts on it and you two obviously weigh in. Initially I thought maybe we try and do every three weeks on Wednesday at the same time, but alter you know, working around planning board. But that's kind of messy. It just doesn't work. Um I think once a month is too little. I'm a little hesitant about twice a month because that feels like a lot of commitment, but where how do you how do you do what are you for thinking about? Well, why don't we do it twice a month? Uh, because it's easier to cancel a meeting than it is to uh, um, propose one. And second, I, I support the Wednesday Wednesday time. I would, given that I don't think uh, these are going to be as long. Well, they're not going to be as long as planning board meetings, I'm sure. So it would be helpful, I would say, to start them at seven rather than six thirty, because even then we go we go for an hour, an hour and a half, or whatever, even two hours, but still a respectable mid evening uh, finish time. So yeah, I would uh, I would suggest uh, two weekly, even even Wednesday evenings starting at seven. Uh, I agree, and I think maybe it should be the Wednesday following a planning board meeting just uh so it's in our head and when things come up in planning board that we you know 
sort of yes well if, if we're doing our thoughts that we want to get together and discuss them then that next weekend we can zone yeah. in on it so that if, if we're doing them uh, twice monthly on, on second and, and on even wednesdays they would always be uh, after the you know they would always that condition would always apply yep after every yeah. planning board i mean yeah. we used to do that yeah, with so, uh, oh, sorry we used to do that the historical commission have two meetings a month but you know the first one was the primary meeting and if if the second one wasn't necessary then it would be waived so it could be that the first you know wednesday or whatever the first meeting is always um you know will always be a standing meeting and then the second one you know could just be confirmed you know you know just in case like it might be that oh you know given a holiday or if people are doing research that maybe it doesn't be isn't needed but you know we could say that the first wednesday is always a the standing meeting time that makes okay. sense to me sure so that puts us so unless i have something wrong in my calendar about regular planning board it looks like regular planning board for next week 29 and then, think, uh, uh, well, it's a fifth. It's a fifth Wednesday. I'm not sure whether yeah, we've uh, decided to do that or not. I think we decided not. Oh, oh yeah, we skipped that. So, so it's then, the fifth, yeah, you're on the fifth. So that would put the subcommittee on the twelfth, and then the twenty sixth. Yep. So I I have hopefully Fred is here because the month of June I'm in Germany. So, okay. starting from the 1st to the 30th. I, I did have an email exchange with Fred. He thought generally Wednesdays would work. So, hopefully that'll yeah. be okay. Okay. Nate, what are the rules if we know we won't have quorum, we just can't have the meeting? Or is there a way in advance to, to do something about that? I think we can yeah. have a meeting. We can't make decisions. Yeah, I mean, the recommendation is usually not to meet. And so... Um, you know, because then everything has to be repeated again. And so typically if, for instance, we say June um, 12th is good and the end of the month looks like it might not work. I mean, it could just be through email that we, you know, before an agenda needs to be posted, we could, I mean, I'm flexible. If, if everyone's like, oh, well, we could just do that Thursday or something like, you know, it's pretty easy on my part to do that. Um, so but. just just as a question, could, for example, Jesse and Bruce meet for coffee if if they don't have a quorum and they know they're not going to june i'm always gone can they just meet for coffee and talk and then yeah so you know the town um attorney sometimes cautions against that but the, it, it, to me that's um it's considered a, a sub quorum of even this subcommittee and so to me that would be all right and so yeah. you I know the the it's a little bit of nuance, but you know, the, this subcommittee was formally voted. And so now it is a standing subcommittee of the planning board. And so it has to follow open meeting. But if Fred and Jesse are like, oh, let's get together. We could talk about, you know, uh, Bruce's research or, or, or Jesse and Bruce about Bruce's research or something. To me, that's fine. I think to be safe, you could just then report on your conversation if you wanted at the next meeting. And so, I mean, I don't, I don't see any problem with that. I think Sometimes I think our attorneys are overly cautious for a good reason, because you can have serial conversations. So the problem being that if Jesse and Bruce meet and then Bruce and Fred meet kind of whatever it's, whether it's ad hoc or coincidental and they talk about the same things. Now all of a sudden you have a quorum of the subcommittee talking about the same stuff and that can violate open meeting. And so, you know, that's where the caution is, is that, yeah, sure. You can, two people can get together. It's just that, you know, you don't want that one person to turn around and talk to someone else. And, you know, all of a sudden it's, you're having this serial conversation as they call it. So. Huh. Right. So what you're saying is as long as we disclose that conversation happened, it's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as long as like, you know, if Bruce, you and Jesse meet and talk about something, someone doesn't, doesn't talk to someone else, you know, Karen or Fred, and then have these offline conversations when the whole point of it is then it should be happening in the open meeting. But. Okay. Okay. So then we're saying the second and fourth Wednesday is at seven. Mm -hmm. Do we need to move and vote on that? Or we... so that's something I don't know, Nate. How much no, I think to be actually voted? No, I think it can just be consent. agreed by consensus. To me, this isn't um yeah. And it, to okay. me, it's like I said, it's flexible. If all of a sudden next week someone's like, Oh, I, I'm gonna be out of out of town on the fifth or, or the twelfth or whatever, it's like, okay, well, it's we could move it to the next week at some time. I'm not really great. 
Um, other thing I'm ignorant about, things that are sent to the subcommittee, like Fred's email, like uh, Ira's email, do we need to present and discuss those or those are just circulated to the board as information for the subcommittee? Yeah, I mean, Fred was asking me to share his email and I, you know, at some point we could discuss them under public comment or not, you can just catalog them away. I think what I would like to do online is have, um, you know, part of the packet, it could be the following month or, you know, meeting now would be public comments received and we could just put those in there, you know, redact some information, but have those be part of the, um, part of the packet. I mean, I think right now as your first meeting, I mean, you're not really even getting into some of the substance, you know, maybe some of the general general themes. And so some of the public comments are, you know, I think they could be discussed at a later meeting. It doesn't have to be today. Gotcha. First uh, I see Janet McGowan's name yeah. and I see it as a panelist, uh, yeah. but, but she's not looking uh -huh. at me. No, uh, she's an attendee. Yeah. Uh, it's, she's on the oh hold, oh hold on I beg your pardon you're right um yeah. I had uh she's under panel I I for a moment lost track of how this uh, participant uh, thing works okay hi Janet yeah I think the um yeah so Jesse I think public comment I mean I, that's up to the chair I I do think that you know if it's a few comments it could be summarized or like I said we can just fold it into the next packet and so you know realistically. I can say, you know, I can share an email, but, you know, I sent Fred's email very, you know, recently. It's like, does, has, have everyone read it? I mean, to me, it's like, and I would love to do this with the planning board too, establish a, something where it's like, if we want to meet, have comments at least 48 hours in advance so I could forward them on to you. And, you know, I mean, it can't always be helped, but, you know, if we, if we know where, if we know what we think we're going to talk about as a subcommittee next month, we could get the agenda posted more in advance. And then if we get comments, we can, you know, send them off, but. I don't want to be, you know, scrambling at four thirty on Wednesday before the subcommittee meeting to try to get everyone comments or information. It's just, you know, the hope would be we could have yeah. a, a pretty systematic approach to it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, okay, what other logistics do we need to work out? Um. So, uh, I've got a couple of thoughts. Vis-a-vis uh, sure. -vis, uh, things that could be done. Uh, the first, maybe it's only one. I read, uh, I've heard thread on this a number of times, and I have to confess, I don't, oh, sorry, I haven't. Sorry, sorry, Bruce, to interrupt. I meant like around meeting logistics, not so much content. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm changing the subject. I'm, I'm. Maybe I shouldn't do that. But uh, yeah, hang on one second. Nate, is there anything else we need to like get organized? No, I mean, I feel like we're pretty good. You know, we do have to post minutes uh, and agendas minutes like in a timely manner that doesn't have to, you know, it could be weeks. Um, uh, you know, we have we have chair and co-chair, vice chair. Uh, we have a meeting time and date. And I think we can get that all up online. So no, I think we're pretty good. Uh, I guess one other thing would be, these are over Zoom for now. I mean, at some point, if the committee or subcommittee wanted to meet in person, we could do that. You know, I, I'll say we won't set it up as a hybrid meeting. It would just be in person. You'd have to take minutes. Uh, and then that would be distributed and that could be fine. You know, I'm not, you know, town hall closes early unless we know, for instance, that um, you're going to meet and then, you know, we just have to let everyone know it could be, so, and it could just be anywhere. It could be as long as it's a publicly accessible space. So for instance, you could meet in the Jones library or you could meet in the meeting room of like the UU if, you know, for instance, if that was available, uh, as long as it was posted and everyone knew about it, but. I mean, Zoom's pretty comfortable. But, but you cannot meet at someone's house, is what you're saying? Uh, no, the, usually not. I mean, you could, but, you know, is it fully accessible, right? So, you know, is it accessible to someone that has any mobility? And then is it open to the public? And so if you're willing to say, you know, I have enough parking, um, someone in a wheelchair or, or with a mobility device can get into my house, into the meeting room, sure. But you know, then the bathroom might not be accessible. So yeah, I would just say typically no. <laughs> well, Understood. my house satisfies all of those criteria because we've got the ample parking, we've got a ramped entry and we've got an accessible bathroom. Excellent. So you're volunteering. <laughs> I'm saying that we could, uh, the, the, my house satisfies those criteria. So if we wanted to do it here, uh, 
Um, theoretically, I mean, from that point of view, at least we could. So we'll see. I think I think that sounds like a great idea to do every other thing or something. I, I do too. Yeah. Yes, finally to be together. But yeah. uh, um, Nate, so using the town room, does that put you guys out? Is that a big deal for staff to make that happen? I mean, if it's after hours, we just have to notice it and, you know, uh, let other staff know, not necessarily. I mean, I can check with Chris before I confirm that, but, you know, often, you know, people will meet in town, you know, I just, yeah, I would want to make sure just because right now there's only a few committees meeting in person in the town hall, but. Mm -hmm. Okay. To be determined. Let's say, let's say the next one will meet on Zoom and then we'll decide. Sure. Moving forward. Yeah. Okay. Any other structural things to talk about. Not that I can think of. Okay. So number three on the agenda was what we want to do with the subcommittee. And um, since I only see one attendee, I'm tempted to allow this attendee to join our discussion of what the subcommittee goals are, unless there's objection. I think it's the chairman's discretion and you're the chair. Okay then I'm going to let Janet join our discussion, if she's willing. If she's willing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. I, I, I was asked if I wanted to stay as an attendee, so <laughs> <laughs> thank you. My apologies for the art behind my head. Oh, it looks, like a, looks like a... Hotel. <laughs> no, it, it looks like a a, a, a Central African halo. <laughs> make it. Okay. Um, Bruce, you want to get us started? I cut you off earlier. Oh, only to say that uh, clearly Fred's got something that is uh, uh, clearly close to his heart. He's mentioned it uh, to us and, and me particularly on a number of occasions. Um, I don't completely understand. Uh, I confess that I haven't dug into the bylaw to completely understand it and so forth. But uh, Fred's uh, email uh, is, 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 not, is, is, is not a good explanation of, of uh, his case. It's confusing. And I think it would be good for us to have Fred or somebody understand, uh, sorry, explain what it is and why it matters um so that it's clear because i'm i i'm i am not clear on uh, this matter but it does sound rather important and i do recall when it was on the planning board that he did move this through and i didn't remember that it passed unanimously at town meeting but that would probably be one of the the rare things even the uh the last item on before the town meeting was dissolved was uh, uh, uh I, th I can't remember what it was, but it, it, was, it, was, it was close, but it wasn't unanimous. So I'd like to know what he's talking about. Yes, I completely agree. I was a little confused by the email, but I read it pretty quickly. So I propose we put it on the agenda for June 12th. And hopefully he'll be here and he can give us some more explanation. Um, and I'll try and look at the, the bylaw as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought, you know, Fred was jumping right in, you know, with footnote M and other things. And you know, my thought would be for this subcommittee and I'll get them online, but, you know, sending the town's 2021 compre uh, comprehensive housing policy, the council adopted, you know, the UTAC report, housing report from a few years ago. Uh, the trust is going through a new action planning process. So they kind of have some draft uh, action plan and goals and just kind of, you know, stepping back a little bit and saying, okay, well, here's, you know, we could say, okay, here's what the trust is looking at. And they're, I think they're going to be looking at uh, unit creation and preservation, some fundraising for the trust, and then public outreach, and they'll have specific action steps and then goals. You know, the planning board has been talking about zoning or other other you know regulatory pieces, and it could be that, uh, you know, maybe it's, you know, a few bigger goals. One might be where where can there be density and where do we want to restrict density, and you know, and then from there it's like okay, well, what are the tools? the actions and objectives to get to that. If, if say density, we're talking about village centers or certain areas, what does that mean? And then if we're talking about restricting density, to me, that's where like Fred's email comes into place. You know, if we're, if we're concerned about, you know, 10 units on an acre or an RG, you know, is there a different way to get at that? If we're, you know, if we think, you know, three units on, 
half acre is kind of where we want to settle, maybe that's the, the right number or something. And then it's like, okay, what does that mean in terms of our zoning or, or, or bylaws? And so, you know, there's a new rental registration uh, that's getting um, going. Actually, let me just make a note to myself for that. I can get that out there. And so, you know, I, I feel like for the subcommittee, you know, where do you want to fit in with all these pieces? You know, what is CRC doing? What's the subcommittee? What's the housing trust? What's the general planning board? And, you know, there's probably a few pieces. The trust doesn't really touch zoning or certain regulations so much. And so I think that's a, a really good place for this subcommittee. So I, I didn't mean to just jump right in, but I, you know, I'll, I think we can get some of these documents posted and kind of have that kind of conversation about maybe start broad and then narrow it down a little bit. Thanks. Thanks, Janet. So um, I don't. I haven't seen Fred's memo, uh, memo or email, but I've talked to him about this. And so footnote M is a way of limiting density in the RG. So without footnote M, you could have nine units per acre. With footnote M, it's down to seven units an acre. And what he said was the original footnote M, I think, had things at four units an acre. And so. I'm assuming he's talking about that. And so um, one way to limit density in the RG and the attractiveness to investors is just to go back to the original footnote M or just get rid of footnote M and just make, you know, lower density in the RG, you know, straight on kind of thing. Uh -huh. Just by, So I think that's what he's talking about. And, you know, if one of the goals of this committee is figuring out how to keep residential neighborhoods with a mix of people, making it super attractive to investors um, to build very dense housing with our zoning is probably not a way of protecting neighborhoods. Um, so I think that would be probably looking at that, just how dense do we want the residential neighborhoods to be? Um, and I, you know, I've said this before in planning board meetings, like I don't think, I know I've, some people have come to the board in years past saying, they really want the ability to build multifamily housing in town. And we, of course we have that, but I, I keep on thinking nobody wants to build a sixplex or a sevenplex or a nineplex. You know, that's not, you know, I, you know, I wouldn't come to Amherst and say, I'd like to put in, build a $3 million, $4 million housing complex so I can get a good cheap unit out of it. So I think that's probably what Fred is talking about, like lowering density in the RG through the zoning. Well, the, the problem, Janet, is that, uh, yes, that's what Fred has been talking about on one, on, on one occasion when you talked to him, but, uh, but, but the uh, email that he sent um, didn't have any of what you just said in it. It just said something else. And uh, so he, he, he makes his case or whatever in different ways at different times. And that's the confusion that I was talking to. And I think the chair, Jesse, also felt. So we just want to find out, essentially, in bullet form, one, two, three, and four what's what the score is i will no longer comment on things i haven't read <laughs> <laughs> yeah um okay yeah i mean uh, i think yeah i was gonna say you know the trust i've talked about it we're making a, a, a small tweak to inclusionary zoning but sometimes i feel like inclusionary zoning could be changed right and i don't know if the subcommittee would want to look at that if you know, the footnote M is right, is about additional lot area per family for a unit. You know, is that something that's um, worth looking into? You know, Mandy, Joe, and Pat had suggested, you know, it seemed what maybe some, it, maybe it seemed like perfunctory to some people, but a pretty sweeping change, you know, changing the permitting approvals for a number of uses and then adding a triplex definition. And so, you know, and duplexes, is that worth it? I, I you know, I, I sometimes I think that having, honestly, design guidelines, not very detailed, but uh, almost like directional massing and some other things for neighborhoods. So if we do allow, say, four units to a half acre in RG, that the units, you know, you could even say like they have to be um, oriented in a certain way and there's only one driveway curb cut or, or something. And to me, those are the things that become important. But I think, you know, I, again, maybe looking at some of the town documents and policies first, I just you know, I, I, I feel like there's so many different things you could do. And, you know, rental registration is trying to get at kind of the maintenance and inspection of rentals. And uh, so, I mean, I think we could look at that. It's a pretty pretty big uh, change to the rental registration bylaw that's moving forward. 
I yeah. think density is, uh, if we want to focus and start with specifics, density is definitely worth talking about because it, it, for example, Faring Street density means paving a lot of the land and, and everything. We really have to look at that. And I liked uh, what you said about if we allow a lot of density in certain areas like University Drive, maybe we don't have to uh, open up other RG areas and we can preserve some of the, you know, the historical character, the flair, the openness, the green of the center of town. So I think that's one thing I, I would prioritize talking about density pretty soon. Bruce, go ahead. Um, another way of approaching this would be to um, take the, the goal statement that Mandy Jo Haneke and Pat DeAngelis put in their mm -hmm. proposal of a, a year and a half ago, uh, or maybe it was a, yes, it was a year and a half ago. Um, it was a, a, a goal statement that everybody agreed with, which is how do we it was actually, I think, pretty good. It was uh, how do we, how do we stimulate uh, um, workforce and moderate income housing? How do we get that? And uh, the reason why I like that is because it was a it was a really good goal. But in order to get there, you had to solve the student housing problem. So it's a goal. Uh, it's a simple goal statement, but it actually has a pretty wide coverage because for that reason. And that was what got me going on uh, all of that research that I was actively doing for the six months uh, from 18 months ago to 12 months ago and have, have, have let lapse a little since or a lot since. But that, but the, the advantage or the benefit or the, or the strength of that is it's a really, it's, it's two. Uh, one main one is that it's a pretty simple uh, point of departure from which I think we could cover a lot of ground and we wouldn't lose track because we've got a simple objective. The number two is, I think it actually dignifies um, that effort that Pat and, Anne, uh, and Pat and Mandy Jo started, which we, everybody, particularly the public comment section of our meetings for six months, were so disparaging of. And, you know, in the end, we decided not to recommend, and it seems to have uh, passed into the, 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 the history of, of activity in the town. But, um, but, I, but, but I think it was the right question. I think it was the right goal. I think it was laudable, and I think we all said so at the beginning before we tore into the mechanics of it and got completely confused as they kept trying to adjust it as we and others mentioned this and that and the other thing. So starting back where they started, but going in a different, but handling it in a different way, might be a, a a nice thing to do in a way, but also good from our point of view because it gives us a simple benchmark um, and reference point. I I, I like that a lot, uh, actually, Bruce. I was I was gonna add some comments telling off of what Nate said that what I was hoping this subcommittee would do was not do as they listen out the things that other groups are already doing mm -hmm. and really focus on the neighborhood character preservation and all the things that your data brought up in our planning board discussion, um, which to me has to start with figuring out some of the data. Like what, what do we currently have? So I feel like that's an important piece in terms of where are mm -hmm. the rentals, where, how far apart, all that kind of trying to get it in a GIS mapping so that we can actually intelligently look at it by neighborhoods or whatever, but it has to include all that. But I really like your idea of having that overarching focus as a goal. Um, yeah. And yeah, um, the data piece, I think someone, maybe Fred or someone else, or I, maybe it was Ira, Ira mentioned that. And I think the data is important during the housing production plan, we'll, we'll, we'll um, have the consultant look at that. And it might, um, and I think it might be that maybe this committee too, some of the uh, you know discussion could be what is the data we want or think we need, and then it's you know trying to figure out do we have it, where do we get it, you know I will say that someone just asked recently for a, a ZBA permit. Oh well, how many 
single family homes have been converted in this neighborhood in the last so many years. And we actually don't have very good record keeping for that, uh, in part because a single family home doesn't need any land use permitting. So, you know, it could be that a room is rented, it could become a whole rental. Our rental registration doesn't necessarily capture when that happened. And the assessor isn't out there, you know, twice a year, once a year asking necessarily. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's like, oh, you know, for duplexes or something that has a permit with it, we could track it. But for single family homes, it's a little, it's a little more difficult. But I think that it, that could be a data point we want to capture. You know, how is that, how how is that being recorded, or you know, where does it go? Um, it seems that uh, with the new rental laws, you're going to be able to track it better because when the house goes from single family, it goes into a rental. If they get a permit. If they get a permit. <laughs> Janet. In terms of tracking data, I think, I, I, I can't remember who was looking for this like a few years ago, is how to track student rentals. And so you you have the problem where maybe pla places are being rented and nobody has a permit, but the question is who's in the rental? And I think, you know, I think you could probably just walk around the RG and ask neighbors, you know, oh. you know, because you know, I, you know, I've I live next to a rental house, and I could tell you every time there was a student, um, students renting, none of which were ever a problem, but you know when they're students and not, you know, and so there's, I don't think there's any box to ticks in the rental registration now. Is there a Nate like saying this is a student rental? Because that's the data we sort of need, but I think we could actually gather it, you know, just or somebody could by word of mouth of just trolling neighborhoods. Um, you know, I I, 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 I live near other are rental you, houses, they're not students. Are you allowed to uh, have a box in there saying uh, yeah. you know, this student rental? Yeah, but you would be, you know yeah. that's, But it's complicated. How do you define student? I'm a student, yeah. I take classes sometimes. Yeah. But it's, it's not straightforward is the problem, partly. Right. I mean, I had a long time. Can you be can and... you be specific and say, are you an undergraduate student? Or, no, you can't say undergrad, but you could say full time student. You can't like full hit at people. Student ages. is is again. You know. I think yeah, I was gonna say I think if that's you know something that we would want, the trust has been asking, and I think um, you're putting a request in through the town manager to have UMass really look at some of their data, and then it would also be the other colleges, and so. I mean, we piece it together, but I, it is hard. You can't really ask, you know, are you an 18 to 24 year old student? Um, and then, right. uh, you know, through parking permit data, we can get at it uh, rentals um, sometimes too. And so, but, you know, I, I think, right, maybe the subcommittee comes up with what are some nice um, data sets that could be missing, but would want to capture. I do think moving forward that the rental registration might, you know, once implemented would be a good, you know, could moving forward would be great, but, you know, historical data then is hard to track. And so even now it's an, it would be through a number of different sources. We could try to get stuff, but. You know, the, the other thing is, I think you're right about the history, but every landlord knows whether they have a student. Right. So, and so you have a, usually you have a person, I, I, I have a, I'm a landlady and I always know like people, what they, where their source of income is. And, you know, if they're a student, they don't really have one. And so that's then you have someone cosign and blah blah blah. I, I I agree that that data could be useful. To me, what's what's more relevant, honestly, is you know the house or the land or the structures are remaining single family, or they're not. Because this is the and, this is what and keeps coming up. Occupied, maybe. Well, well owner, occupied. but I'm saying single family, one unit, even if it's three bedrooms and it's rented to students. To me, there's still potential that that can turn around at some point. Once it becomes a split up house with multiple units, that's that's in my opinion. That's where we don't. That's what we want to prevent from happening all over the place, because that that's never going to come back to be a family comes to town and they want to live in town, so they buy a duplex but, and reconvert it to a single family. But, but so that data is pretty easy to capture, right? Whether it's single family or multi unit so you're you're excluding though uh owner occupied with a couple of rumors you know students in the attic. right but right i agree but to me that counts as a 
you know, it's still a single house on a lot in the neighborhood. Like it's not, it's very different from two units or this is now two units and that like what just happened behind me on fearing, we're gonna build two more two unit houses. So right. it's a totally different arrangement and the single unit household, whether it's rented or not, is not really disrupting the neighborhood character present or future in my mind. Like if all the houses here were rented, but stayed as they are, I think that is, that's not so bad. It can turn around at some point. If they all get converted to multi-units, additional properties, additional dwellings on the land, that's never coming back to what it was. That's kind of the way I think about it. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and I, I cut you off the mark, I don't know. I'll make one more comment that I will want to focus on pretty soon and I'm willing to try and do the work. I was really struck by the presentation of 98 Fearing by the architects because they clearly had the GIS data already with where the rentals were, which we don't have. So I, I you know, I was like, wait, well, how do we get that? And I'm sure we can't get it from them, but they clearly had someone do the work. They have someone who knows the tools, who knows how to use the mapping, who knows how to take the town info about rentals and just pop it in and populate a map that you can then use in that way. So I, I feel like that'll be a pretty good tool for us to get our hands on. I I was, of course, as a commissioner, both Karen and I were there. Uh, I, I assumed, I guess possibly incorrectly, I assumed that that data was uh, provided by the town. But um, Jesse, you're telling me that was not true. I, Nate, is that correct? Wrong. Nate, Nate would know better than I. I was just at the historic meeting and they showed a couple snapshots of the neighborhood and with in pink were like the rentals and in yes yes like that's that. what they showed us that's what they showed the local historic district commission and and i i was interested but i didn't i didn't remark as you did as it uh it was an opportunity that they had a source that we didn't have access to uh, is that correct nate we they have a source that we don't have access no, i to? think you know they could have uh, pulled from the town's gis or the assessor's information and you know, I, I I probably would think that that information was like eighty percent accurate. I mean, yeah. it's a visual, it's a visual, right? It's a nice tool. You yeah. know what I've been told when people request it is that we have to kind of have that caveat that it's not uh, systematically updated. And so, you know, even the assessor's card where it says if it's owner occupied or non owner occupied, that might be, you know, a year or two or more out of date. And so the problem being. When something like that's displayed, you're like, oh, that's my, that that's you know, once you see it, you think it's real or accurate, but it may not be. And so, as staff, we've been hesitant to share that. So I think earlier, um, the last year, Jesse and I were going back about some of the data, and I think now on our GIS viewer, if you you can do like a search, you can do like find all properties that are within 300 feet of whatever, and you can now the um, owner occupancy status is now uh, a current, meaning it's pulling from, I think, all the current property cards. But then, you know, the assessor said, well, the property cards have some margin of error. But that's probably what they did. It's it's available data. It's just that it hasn't been ground truth. So what happened was when we started the new rental um, registration program, we realized that, you know, there was, you know, a, a pretty big number of properties that were saying they were fully rented, but they were saying owner occupied on the assessor's card and then trying to, uh, staff was going manually through every property to start trying to get it all, everything up to date. And so, you know, you know, I, I, we're getting there, but it's just not, it's hard to, anyways, it's just hard to get a real, you know, say a hundred percent accurate. Maybe we can get like 90% or something. Yeah, but, I mean, but even that's useful. I mean, so so that is available now on the mapping tool because it wasn't it, whenever it was six months ago when I was. Trying no, to it, it is now. Yeah, I was told it is now. So that's probably where they got it. That's great. Yeah, because I mean, speaking as, as a former architect, uh, there are certain things that uh, our, uh, my fellow professionals would be quite hesitant to submit without knowing something for sure. But uh, that kind of data is not among them, and they would simply represent that uh, we would simply represent that we were reporting uh, what we understood to be uh, publicly available data. And I can see from Nate's point of view, as he's just said, he's in a very different position because he's he's the uh, seen to be the gatekeeper or the custodian of those data. So uh, I can see why uh, 
which is where more or less where I when I I I took that with a grain of salt. I thought, yes, there's the stuff around that's true, more or less. I mean, it's been that way for a long time. My wife grew up in that neighborhood seventy years ago, and uh, she had uh, fraternities on either side of her. So, and, you know, the other problem I was having when I was trying is. I'm just not familiar with the tools. So if we wanted to ask yeah. how far apart are all the rentals in this area, I don't know how to do that. So so clearly, you know, I, mean, I had ideas about trying to find a grad student or someone who is knowledgeable, yeah. pull that out for us because yeah. it, it is a whole skill set that certainly I don't have. Hmm. Neither do I. Well, yeah, if, if, sorry, if the subcommittee has some of those requests and we, you know, they're documented, I can, uh, help do it, or I could point to someone who can. Um, yeah, I know I was just watching a show actually last night, and the person does um, like online sleuthing and digging, and it's amazing what you can do if you're like, you know, all of a sudden you have like, you know, this genealogy, and then you can do this and this, and it's like, oh my gosh, it's, you know, all these scanned newspapers. And I mean, it really does take a lot. I mean, if, you, if, if you're keyed into it, it's great, but it is, I, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. And then you got to do it next to you because it doesn't stay still. <laughs> Janet. So I think this idea sounds fantastic and, you know, maybe take it in bites and it'd be great to have a grad student, but, you know, maybe do the RG and there's parts of North Amherst that are like 80%, you know, yeah. or more rental housing. And um, those people have sort of faded away from planning board meetings because there seemed to be like no help coming, I think, but it would be interesting to see, you know, around the university, those neighborhoods that are most affected and we all know that right <laughs> but to document it and then you know i've heard can people talk about being as far away as pomeroy village and you little sorry the, janet sorry i you yeah, i cut out your last sentence by mistake. oh i said so i said i you know I've, I've heard people from areas like pomeroy village we have a lot of little subdivisions from the 60s and 70s there saying that you know there's investors or buying up housing and they're all being converted. So maybe start small and just sort of break out, you know, I, I would be a great grad student project, you know. From our point of view. Yeah, I agree. But, you know, we have to, why don't we choose one specific area since we can't do it all, I think, uh, in a timely fashion and we're we're trying to move ahead. Why don't we choose one area to concentrate on and then figure out how we can get the data. And that will be interesting too, because it's changing. I mean, if, if we chose the area around Lincoln Sunset, I can tell you, or, or just around town, I can name the houses that are being sold and rent the owners are leaving and investors are coming in. It's moving pretty fast. I understand so, what you're saying, but I kind of disagree. I think it might, disagree? Not be fair. it just might not be fair for us to say, let's just focus on this neighborhood. No, and it doesn't have to be this, but are we going to do the whole thing or should we do it? I, yeah, I chose this because I live here, but I, I agree. That's not fair, but we could choose one representative area. Uh, I think I think if we're going to figure out how to access the data that way, doing the whole town wouldn't be that different than doing a quarter of the town. So wow. I don't see a problem with that. I think we do need to think about different parts of town have different issues, right? Which is kind of what I was trying to bring up when I, whenever that was, six months ago, when I put together the, the numbers. Um, mm -hmm. But to, so the way I've been thinking about it recently is wanting to get the data in that format where we can look at proximity of rentals as one question, density by neighborhood of rentals as another question, and then really needing to think about the different strategies that Bruce had presented about how other towns have tried to address this problem and and then see if we think any will fit our situation as a as a way to move mm. forward. I can I can give you I thought about this over as I was driving today and I I, I thought I could probably give you five minutes or even three minutes of uh, the essence of uh, talking to, I think, the five or six, because uh, they, uh, I was thinking they were all kind of different, you know. They, they, the, the. If I'll, I'll continue for until you for a couple of minutes. 
Charlottesville, for example, seem to uh, currently be solving its problem by um, supporting the the university in uh, building uh, uh, third party developer housing on university land for students, primarily for, well, primarily for students. But let's say probably there's some faculty or graduate student housing in there as well. I suppose I don't know, but you know we're talking three to five thousand units, as I recall, in two phases. Uh, so that was Charlottesville's way of doing it. Large housing concentrations addressed at the student market very specifically on the on I think on the campus or on perhaps on on, on uh, land that the university owned or controlled. Then uh, uh, State College was quite different. The State College was the place where they really had uh, developed these. Um, these regulations to control the uh, the spread of student uh, uh, rental housing through existing neighborhoods, and they had these distance laws, and and uh, and they had a student uh, residence uh, definition in there by law, and they had they've been doing this for quite a while, and they were uh, so they had developed it, and as I recall, they were mindful of the. Uh, the, the the potential uh, legal uh, challenges that would that may over time make their way up through the uh, courts to maybe the Supreme Court where such in some some fashion this would be stricken down or they wouldn't be able to do it in, exactly or in any way or quite the same way but that was uh, that was a a, 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 a a strategy that state college was uh, had 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 developed and some degree perfected over years. Um, Ithaca, as I recall, uh, seemed to be addressing its uh, student, and, and this is all to do with student housing. I think I was really more or less focused on that problem first. There, uh, they had a in their bylaw, uh, they were limiting the number of unrelated persons, and they had the limited to two or to one, depending on the part of town. So it was draconian compared to the way we do it. But they seem to, again, have, uh, uh, have um, um, you know, tied their, uh, whatever, their fasten that was the wagon that their horses were tied to. Uh, Ithaca does have a, a, a well, go to Orono in Maine. Uh, they were... Uh, building larger housing uh, kind of apartments and so forth and they were but Orono is by folk bisected by the river so there's the the student uh, campus part of the town is 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 more uh, uh, clearly divided from the older or more the original part of town so strategies that worked in Orono were I mean, it was like Amherst in, in all of the data ways that I put together, but it was unlike Amherst in, in that geographical way. I made a point of of looking at the uh, Google Earth maps of the regions and the towns and so forth. I, made a, I took a number of screenshots of every one of these towns, I think, that you can see in the folders, so, because I wanted to make sure that that the uh, the numerical data, um, uh, which which indicated similarity, wasn't uh, dumped on by the spatial data, which in the case of Orono, there was some relative, there was a, a particular, a particular condition that that did tend to make a lot of difference. So, but anyway, nonetheless, their solution, as I recall, was that they were um, they were building uh, apartment buildings uh, in the vicinity of campus, and I think it was more of. Uh, the Barry Roberts and and and, uh, and um, I want to say Andrew Pogan or Antipodean. It's not it's archipelago. So it's the archipelago model uh, was more um, a private developer purpose built housing in the vicinity of campus. Um, that was a similar um, strategy for Newark in um, in Delaware, um, where they but but instead of uh, that they they were um, they were uh, supporting, encouraging, and and regulating uh, around hoeing out existing neighborhoods that were perhaps old historic neighborhoods that were two story, and uh, allowing them to grow into a higher rise 
newer developments uh, again in the vicinity of the uh, campus, as I recall, but but it, the, but it was part of the the town as well. So that was the that was their um, solution concept for dealing with housing. Um, and I'll stop there because I can't remember the details of, of a couple of others. But the point was that they were largely dissimilar. I mean, five five towns like us, all of them had a profoundly or slightly different approach to dealing with this problem. Um, and I found that uh, quite interesting. <laughs> I, mean, I, remember, uh, I remember thinking quite a bit about this when you presented that. For us, and the the minimum distance one to me struck me as the most potentially the most effective for us. It's most effective I, for protecting our neighborhoods, but it's not most effective for providing student accommodations, which no. takes the pressure off the housing to make well, it affordable it do, to moderate income people. Well, what it could do is spread could could alleviate the pressures on the immediate neighborhoods. And allow that to happen to some degree in neighborhoods where it's not happening yet, right? Yes, you could. And, it's a bit like the large lot uh, development scenarios and the septic system requirements in the uh, hill towns, where they their strategy is to spread development across the landscape. Uh, when it's said like right. that, it's, it's it's obviously not something that I think is a good idea. But it's it's a uh, it, it, which is not to say that the similar situation that you're talking about is similar, but it, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's. Um... Cause the other, the other, I mean, the unrelated has a enforcement problem, right? Which we already have, we have on the books for people, but that's yeah. probably not respected by a large percentage of rentals, frankly. Um, anyway, Nate, you want to comment? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to jump off in a minute. I'm just going to turn my camera off and then be doing some stuff and I'll come back in a bit. But, you know, if you, if you keep going without me. Yeah, I mean, I think, Bruce, going back to your point, if the goal or vision is, you know, um, housing opportunity for, say, workforce or moderate income or something, then, you know, it might be there's a discussion about, well, what, how do we get there? Is it uh, increasing the vacancy rate? Is it reducing investor pressure? And so maybe there's a few ideas uh, or a few causes or something, and then some ideas of how to address that. And it could be that there's, you know, a few that have to happen together. I think, you know, when we talk about University Drive, really trying to create density in some areas, maybe the idea is, well, is there one other place in town where we can encourage density and then have, whether it's minimum distance requirements or, you know, adjusting footnote M or having some other, some standards or conditions. And so, you know, it may be that, that you know, there's a few different uh, ideas that have to be pr proposed. You know, uh, uh -huh. you know, like a few years ago, planning staff had said, could we do an overlay over existing apartment complexes? Uh, you know, because at one point they were permitted in the 60s and 70s and UMass grew and then they the zoning changed. So they're, they're almost all non-conforming. But, you know, when we did the comprehensive housing market study, the consultant said, wow, some of these places could, you know, quadruple in density. And it has to be at a certain point where it actually makes financial sense, but it wouldn't actually change a lot because there's already density there, but it would just be, you know, having a better layout, maybe going up a floor, maybe a, two floors on the, in the core. But the idea would be if you had better design and planning, it actually wouldn't be so impactful, you know, aesthetically. And if you, you know, depending on traffic, you know, there's some concerns, but, you know, they're saying essentially you could do it and manage it in a way that it's still, you know, you're still having it in a controlled way. And, so it may yeah. not, you know, one of my notes to uh, to send to you would be some prior zoning amendments or ideas, but I feel like there's probably a number of things that could be discussed. And I mean, I look at some of these layouts of apartment complexes, you know, from the sixties and seventies and there, you know, we've talked to a few property owners and they say it's, it's hard because you'd have to take units offline for a few years, they lose rent and then is it worth it? But, you know, when you look at some of the spaces around the buildings, it's just, you know, I feel like you could have had a much tighter building footprint, even going up, going up a floor and still have better usable open space than what's on in some of them. And, mm. you know, I don't know if you can incentivize that or not, but, you know, maybe there's a, a, a number of approaches, but I do like the idea of trying to go back to if that's the vision statement or something, and then how to, how can it be achieved? 
Nate, I have a question. Since of what you said about taking things offline and then having to redo them, I know this is university property and all, and it's not, uh, but the university apartments up on North Pleasant Street, which uh, where that whole site of uh, one and two story apartments was bulldozed and they built one and two story apartments back again. It, why, why didn't they build, uh, why didn't they double the density there? Is there, do you, was that even considered? Do you know? I, I mean, I don't, I wasn't, and I don't think there was much, I, I wasn't involved in any conversations there. And so, um, yeah, it's an it interesting just, question. It just seems like a colossal missed opportunity given the need that the university had. And they have this place. They've already committed to bulldozing it, which they did. And what do they do? They've got this roaring problem and they shoot themselves in the foot and they build something that, that only, you know, only crosses half the bloody river. I mean, it was it was it, on on the faces of it. It seems to me to be a you know, uh, idiocy, but I'm sure I'm not seeing the whole picture, which is why I'd like to know what I'm missing. Because I go around and I think that we can't afford to be behaving so thoughtlessly in the future because there was there's so many opportunities for housing students that were lost in or people that were lost in that. Uh, in that development. I think it's a good question. I mean, it, you know, it's like, does going to three floors trigger something in code or so many units in terms of cost for fire suppression? I mean, is that, would that really change it or? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's uh, all of what you say is true, but it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't change the economics because uh, I mean, it, it doesn't, it's just because you, you, you get more, you pay a little more for the per unit perhaps, but you, well, I'm not sure you do because it's the cost of construction is going up, but you, your your land costs are staying the same, more or less. So you know, it doesn't make sense to me that yeah, particular instance. So just listening to um the conversation. So hold on, Nate needs to go because uh, I, okay. I railroaded him. So I I want him to give a I want to give him a way out here. Hey, no, no, thanks, but yeah, I'm gonna. I'll continue watching this. I just need to help make some dinner. <laughs> thanks a lot, Nick. Indeed, go. So I, I like the idea of increasing density at the apartment complexes. I think that makes a lot of sense, and it doesn't have to be filled with students. It could be, you know, apartment complexes. You know, I live near a bunch of different places, and um, a lot of that is housing that people, that families or singles or you know, young couples are in, not just students. So I think, but I think the question is. You know, there is a question of where students go, you know, Karen says, as many agree, put them on campus, right? That's that's a no-brainer, I think. But, um, you know, Bruce, when you were looking at at your different solutions or, what you know, different methods, which ones, like, I don't know if it was early enough to tell or late enough to tell, but which ones actually protected the residential neighborhoods? Like, were the experiments going on long enough that... I don't really of... know because I was talking to planners you know of those places so i wasn't there and i was uh so i as many many questions i didn't get to asking but i think uh, in the case of the minimum distance laws and so forth uh, because they were persisting in in using them i think they were working for state college but then the question would be is what about uh, i looked at state college from over you know the, there was nothing that i could learn from the google maps that indicated that it was uh peculiar in some way so uh, uh it could be personality if you get a particular combination or, or a particular individual perhaps who happens to be the planning director and maybe that person stays much longer maybe they develop relationships and maybe these things can somehow uh be because you know if it becomes kind of the community culture then uh, I guess they're easier to to work with because they're diff more difficult to change. But I don't know why. The uh, I think I know that it probably works in terms of uh, preserving the the, the neighborhood uh, stability in State College. But I don't know um, the story about how it you know it all happened and so forth. Okay. I think that would be that would be it. Like the data point is to kind of circle back and say. How is it working? And and did it work? You know, kind of thing. Because, you know, I listened to like two of those international consortiums of college towns, 
And, you know, everybody had a different, I think, I don't know if you were on those two, Bruce. Like, I was on at least one of them and maybe two. I can, yeah. because I can remember and, one. <laughs> and Boulder was like, we're building 5,000 dorms on units on campus, but we've also designated a student housing zone for, you know, big buildings filled with students. And so you couldn't say, did that work? Because, you know, partly Boulder is just phenomenally attracted community. Um, and, you know, the average house house price is like a million dollars per single family home. And so, you know, they ha probably have market forces beyond reason. Um, but, you know, if they're facing problems in their neighborhoods of overwhelming students at that, at that price point on a single family house. So we don't know if that had worked, but there was one um, place in Canada that had, was surrounded by universities and colleges. And they just thought, okay, we're going to make a student housing zone between them all. They built all these high rises all the rents were really high and the students were complaining they couldn't afford tuition, rent and food. And so I just thought, oh God, you know, here we go. Maybe it is oh, the obliga obligation of UMass to build affordable dorms on campus. It's a state university. It's not, you know, an elite. So. With University Drive, I got a little worried about that also. That, yeah, we're gonna open it up to these developments but there's no price regulation, right? So. They're going to be more field stones where it's just really expensive and yes yeah, some students will figure out how to make that work but it's not really solving the problem because then the neighboring houses are paid less and they'll still well, the, the pressure won't attractive. yeah um one thing i have always thought about is just you know limiting the percentage of students in like so if it's a fourplex saying half have to be students and half to have to be non-students and so i think that would have an effect i don't know 40 percent or whatever would have effect on calming student behavior and open up housing. I have friends who have been looking to rent apartments or buy condos in Amherst and they just, they, they don't, they leave, you know, one person finally found a place, but it's, it's pretty astonishing. There's no, you know, rents are high or they don't want to live in a place surrounded by students. So, you know, but I think, I think there's two questions. What is working to preserve neighborhoods? And the question where students go can't be ignored because it's, you know, it's like you're pushing water down, creating space for non-students and the water rises. Hmm. Okay. Um, I was kind of hoping, uh, certainly for myself and others were willing to sort of take a little chunk to really pick one issue, one detail to try and focus on to then bring back to the meeting each time as sort of updates or or whenever appropriate, um, just to give us some focus. And and as I sort of said at the planning board when I asked for the subcommittee, I'm really hoping we can in some number of months bring proposals to wherever appropriate. Um, that That's what I'm hoping we'll accomplish. Maybe it's a tall order, but. Mm. Could we could we get a list of like ideas together? Do you know what I mean? Because I was also thinking about demolition by neglect, which is not letting landlords run their apartments for rent and then have them fall apart. And that is substandard conditions for students, but also justifies the tear down or the rezoning or something, you know. And I don't think it helps students to live in ratty kind of housing. You know, you all seem to think That's it's too. But it also uh, creates a very unattractive neighborhood. Great. So, so maybe, maybe just what the what these small pieces are can be just the agenda items for next meeting. Meaning, that's that's a good idea. Put them all. Just enumerate them. Fred, uh, yeah. Zoning piece, Janet. Maybe you can talk about that. I can try and talk about the mapping and proximity stuff. Bruce, if there's some other piece you want to pick up, maybe we can start there. Yeah. Did I just get an assignment? <laughs> maybe, maybe you can flesh out that idea a little more. Okay. And how, and how it would be addressed, really. You know, if, if there are examples or if there are laws we need to know about or what, what demand that puts on the town. Like, you know, these are all issues we have to consider, right? The, the reality of policing whatever rule by law you're going to make. Or sorry, enforcing not so much policing. Yeah. That, I I'm think not going to be able to do much for a while. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, exp I'll, 
I'll dig into my, I'll think more about the work that I did a year ago and see. Your uh, brain is fine to be present. That's all. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll think more about that, but that's, that, uh, that's really where I entered all of this. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out, uh, how to, um, how to deal with student uh, rental, uh, student accommodation pressures on town in a way that uh, keeps the town uh, intact in various ways. Uh, I wonder sorry, if you could find out from Ithaca how they were able to get a, a requirement that there are only two non-related people in the town, how they did that, how they got that through. I I think they just decided that's what they wanted to do and they did it. I mean, uh, I don't think there's any magic to it, but uh, I, why they decided to do that as opposed to something else. Um, I mean, did that come from the planning board? Did it come from the, the who made that decision? And who was involved? Were the people asked? Was was it an well? Open... If I if I went if I took an hour and I asked and found all that out, how would it help us? Yeah, I, I, I don't. I, I, thought I, thought, I thought I heard Ithaca was three unrelated people. Did they downgrade it further? Two. Wow. One and two. It would help us because I think two that... and one. I should say two in the more dense neighborhoods and one in the outlying neighborhoods. I mean, right. it's in my thing there. I can't. I'm. Uh, I, that's my memory. I was surprised. I thought that was pretty draconian by our standards. I think it's. But true. that was the way they handled the problem. That was yeah, their equivalent think... of minimum distancing. Exactly. So I I thought that would be. Uh, I mean, I could ask questions about the. As I did with minimum distancing and so forth, what, what is, what, have they had any legal challenges? What kind of uh, um, you know forces are arraigned against them, uh, and what are they? You know, are they are they uh, uh, are they constitutional or are they local political or what? So I I went in that direction. That's what I wanted to know. Um, but I wasn't so much interested in how they did it because I thought, well, I could spend a lot of time finding that out and our situation is different. But if I know that they did it and what forces they were combating to over, to, to prevail, then I thought we, it would be, and a little bit about the town itself and so forth. Then I thought, well, maybe we could see whether it would be apply, apply here. And I think I remember that Steve Bloom and uh, Steve told me when we were doing a walk around current in our East Amherst, that he and Vince O'Connor were putting together a, a, a proposal for a, a I shouldn't, I'm sure whether it's, it's probably a, 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 you know, not a zoning bylaw, but just a regular bylaw that related to establishing minimum distance requirements in town. But I, that was, that was a year ago and I haven't heard, or yeah, 10 months ago, and I haven't heard anything from anybody about that. So I don't know whether they're still doing that or not. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Bruce, in your research, I, I I I don't know if you sent it around to everybody else, but can I be I, in. Is there further questioning you wanted? Like you, you know, you did the you talked to someone for a half hour. You got information. Are there next steps? Like my question. Mostly, like it was about an hour, and it took me often two hours to get over a period of months to get that conversation. Uh, very often it was quite difficult many times uh, and my plan was to do it in the seven other towns that I'd listed wow. so that was that was what I was doing I was talking to a dozen or 15 planning directors in a dozen or 15 towns and I've got to six or seven of them I've also got a I mean I tried to talk to Megan Tuttle in uh, Burlington and she said I don't have time for you called them and then uh, I thought <laughs> well uh when we went to that uh, that training, that uh, 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 Bob Mitchell, who's the former planning director in Amherst, and who was also the former planning director in Burlington, I said to Bob, I said, your your successor in Burlington is not treating me very well. And he, he said he'd intervene on my behalf. And uh, and even that wasn't successful. All I managed to do was to get a, some, some documents and so forth. So it's not, it's, it's, I mean, I could drive up and bang on the door, which I'm not beyond doing, 
but uh, uh, but I'm not going to do that to uh, Mankato in Minnesota or or Miami in Ohio, which are the next two on my list. But you know, I and I once Manny Joe and Pam uh, Pat's thing uh, pancakes. Uh, then the impetus for doing this uh, changed. Also, the thing that changed was our, you know, creating this 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 conversation that we set up through this the the the, the late summer and fall of of last year, where we ended up uh, focused on among other things University Drive. That also took the pressure off me, well, uh, reduced what I felt was the uh, impetus I had for calling these other people because I thought we had a way forward that made sense based on what I had found out up to that point. So, but I could keep going, but, uh, so, but it's not going to happen for a little while because I've got too much to do in the summer. So my, I'm wondering if you, you know, could, if somebody could pick up like the next two towns or go back. I, I have to say Burlington is surrounded by CD student neighborhoods. So it's I surrounded would, by what? CD student neighborhoods, the university. I was just there. Oh, um, CD. CD, yeah. So yeah. I'm not sure they're whatever they're trying to do isn't really working from what I could visually see. But yeah, if I, you, never, some, I never found out. Yeah. So if there's some next steps or people to call back and ask questions, that might be a task to hand off. Um, yeah, possibly. But then you've got to integrate it. It's better if it's done by one person, I think. Um, I also have heard through rumor mill that this proposal by Pat and Mandy Joe might be coming back in terms uh -huh. of making duplexes easier or I don't know, triplexes or something like that. So, well, you know, yeah, they might, they might decide to bring a portion of it back. Uh, uh, some parts of it kind of made sense, you know, Yeah, but not as a, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I was not, but I mean, if they brought the duplex back, so then I think we would drive, it would drive the minimum distancing because you could say, well, yes, let's, Let's make big. Let's make more apartments, uh, more more accommodations in these uh, in the RG, for example. And we could say, well, okay, that's fine, so long as they don't all end up uh, being, uh, you know, student accommodations. Mm -hmm. And if we had a mechanism for ensuring that, then we all might have a different mind. Mm -hmm. So I I think Bruce, what Janet is saying is that she's going to be off the planning board soon because of the yep. six year limit. And that she would be an uh, awesome person to um, call some of those people when you don't have time. And um... oh, I'm 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 happy to support other people doing this. I'm I'm just thinking that it it it, it becomes a different type of a project at that point. I because... I have found on the solar bylaw working group talking to the planning directors of the towns like super informative because they just start talking and you just you just find out like. I didn't right. you know what the problems were and what happened and what they did. So yeah, yeah. The other thing, Jenna, you're really well suited to figure out is the legality of all these things and what's been challenged and what's not. I guess well, I am. <laughs> when I started yeah. to look, I started to look at some of these strategies. It seemed like some of them have been challenged, and it was really murky from what I could find whether they were successfully challenged yeah. or just challenged and not. Well, they that, down and, that I like that I the, the idea. idea of, Follow up just conversations. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm I'm dropping. I shouldn't be. I, doing I was saying even just the student rental designation seemed to have issues. Like Cambridge, I think, tried to define a student rental. And they had some different things, but I think that got struck down, which I wasn't anyway, I wasn't really clear about what, what's legal to do. Yeah, yeah. I can look yeah. I didn't wouldn't want to do fresh legal research because I've done way too much unpaid legal research. But I think sure. finding out the consequences is good. You know, that four unrelated people comes out of my hometown area of Stony Brook University. And so that was a Supreme Court case saying that students are in a protected class. And everybody seemed very sympathetic about the residents' concerns. But, you know, that was like the 70s or something. So, yeah, I think that's a good question because you don't want to sit there and propose something and have it, you know, it might get bombarded by legal challenges. I don't know. If there's already a precedent shooting it down, it's yeah, not great. Yes, as I recall, a conversation I had with the guy in College Station was that uh, uh, somewhere in Ohio, they had uh, there was a, one of the federal district courts had made an unpromising decision, or maybe they were about to. Um, so it, 
uh, I said, doesn't that give, make you nervous? He said, yeah, it does. But as, as I recall, but he was, you know, they, it, it was so, it was so established in town that they were going to stick with, you know, they, they weren't going to jump ship until they had to. They had but to... I think, uh, uh, Karen, uh, uh, Janet, uh, uh, follow up or additional calls, but particularly follow up calls made, let's say by someone other than me on a, to, 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 to dig into a specific aspect of something that would be uh, probably good. I, I, I'd be leery about uh, exposing these folks to just another, another, another person like me to ask the same questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think, uh, uh, and I did say that uh, I would share this data, these data, this, this stuff with all of the people I spoke to. And, and I've certainly followed up with the, uh, notes of the conversation that I had with the individual, I sent them and so forth, but I haven't collected everything and sent it to everybody yet. Uh, I haven't, I haven't honored that pledge. You might be cre creating a nice brain trust in a way of people, because they're all facing the same problem. You know, Well, I kind of thought that it's, it's, it's you know, when they, and then when that, uh, that um, international, group, whatever it was. It's, Worst name. <laughs> yeah. When that cropped up, I thought, oh, there's already uh uh but it's it's not it's not uh it's not it's not focused on small towns with universities. It's any town. So it could be New York City or it could be Amherst and everything in between. So it's uh you've got to filter it through that uh, particular it needs to be filtered. But it was nonetheless interesting uh, at a broad sense. Uh, and every so often you had a town, because I think on, on, the, on the two sessions, I think they had, what, was it four or six um, cities, towns represented in uh, one way or another. So you, you got to hear from quite a few, and some of them were more like us than others. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, um, okay. I have one more question for the evening, which is, Bruce, do you want to be the vice chair or the co-chair? Oh, let's make it vice. I want you to be the chair. I don't, I, I, also, I, also I, want, I want there to be a chair and I will, uh, when the chair's not here, uh, that's when the vice chair does their job. Otherwise, I don't want there to be a, any 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 confusion that this is my show and your show, Jesse. This is your show, and and we're here for to participate in your show. That's the way I see it. I mean, I'm I mean, tell me if I'm, but I, I, I you know, uh, I'm I'm looking to you for leadership here. And uh, all right, I'll do what I can. We'll see and that. and and I expect to be supportive. Thank you. Me too. Okay. Um. Any other pressing discussion? for tonight. All right. Ice cream always. I have to, officially I have to. All right. Ask for public comment, but there's no attendees except Janet. <laughs> Do you have any public comment? So I'm a little confused about next steps, but I'll wait for the minutes or someone to tell me what uh, I should be doing. <laughs> yeah, I think I think next meeting we're, we're some of us, Fred, I think you, Janet, on the demolition, uh, not demolition on the neglect property issue. Me maybe on the mapping issue. We're each going to present some more, maybe a little more in depth on specific ideas. Um, and, then, and wasn't your assignment that we should sort of have a list of uh, specific things to focus on? Yes. And, and should we email that to you? I mean, yes. Don't Why don't you send me? Uh, I think technically you need to send it to Nate and myself as an agenda item. Yep, I think that's the way it works. Not, not to all of us. So my experience with um, um, I, I think it's great that you're going to set up a housing subcommittee um, website and putting materials on that would be great. My experience that that's really hard to get stuff into it. So every the solar bylaw work working group started out doing that and it completely faltered. 
if you look at our planning board website, like the, our new project is from like four years ago, maybe five. So I, I, there might be sort of a log jam in terms of staff time in the department. I didn't, I didn't, I'm getting stuck up. Sorry, Nate was offering. I didn't want that. So. Oh, okay. Okay, so he was offering he's, that because I, I think it's a great idea, but it's not. No, 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 it's, I, I, okay. We, we like, don't depend on that. Yeah. I'm okay. all for minimizing staff. That's fine. Yeah, okay. me too. And and Jesse, are you going to just write up something and there will be the minutes? Yeah. Or yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, great. I'll I've been taking a few notes and then basically I'm just gonna get the transcript when it's ready and that's great. That's great. We'll go back. Yeah. You know, Nate told I, me uh, I really need to brief. It's fine. Jesse, I think yes, exactly. Uh, the the pattern of uh, minute uh, uh, this, you know, for the for the others is comprehensive and copious, and I don't think we need that. No. Because if we do, then you're not going to want to convene a meeting, and that would not be good. <laughs> okay. And last agenda item was uh, unanticipated business. I don't think there is any. Not for me. Okay. So we're meeting next on June 12th. June 12th. Okay, June 12th. Thank you. Without, without me, but with my blessing. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, okay. enjoy your... Thanks all. Bye-bye. Enjoy, enjoy Europe, Karen. Oh, well, I'll thank see you, you before then, anyway. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.